pay attention to the road. We will go ahead and get started with the work session. Firegate Town Council on Monday night, um, June 7th, 17, 2019. One thing we're going to change tonight, um, previously we haven't had any record of the work sessions. Uh, things tend to get miscommunicated, misconstrued, comments and statements get twisted around to meet individuals' own personal needs when they're repeated. Uh, all in an effort to turn stories in their favor. So uh, from now on, every public meeting that this council has will be recorded so that there is an accurate record of everything that's said that can always be referred back to and used in defense, if necessary, of what was actually said, discussed, and done. So just from here on out, remember that any comment you make at any public meeting that we have will be recorded. First two things I want to talk about tonight is we originally had a public hearing for the uh, discussion on the proposed sewer rate increase scheduled for tonight and we had a call meeting uh, after the public hearing for discussion on uh, the cigarette taxes, you all that were here last month at the meeting, you know, we had a uh, request to consider a possible reduction in the cigarette tax and to uh, maybe afford that so that the only person selling cigarettes in town could be a little bit more competitive with the other convenience stores in the area. So it slipped by us to get the ads for those printed in the Virginia Review on time. So we've had to readjust our dates for those two meetings to come into compliance with uh, state code requirements. So the public hearing and the call meeting have been rescheduled for this Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And then that will allow us seven days from the public, second public hearing on the proposed sewer rate increase until our next council meeting, which is next Thursday night, so we can vote on it because the state code requires at least seven days between the public hearing, second public hearing and the vote on the rate increase. Wendy, anything you want to add to that? No, it was my mistake. Well, I'm, we're not worried about that. It just, <laughs> it's just one of those things that happened, unfortunately. And as I said on the phone to you the other day, we'll just work through it. And it's just a little bit more inconvenient that we have to come back Thursday night for another meeting. But that was the only way we could get the time frame right for the notifications to make it work. Right. We're just glad that we had that ability to get that done and still be able to put the new budget into place 1st of July. Okay. We've had some uh, equipment problems. Um, the dump trailer has been in the shop this week. Uh, apparently the town crew couldn't uh, get it to raise up and lower. Uh, the, the gentleman that worked on it for us has been working on our equipment, worked with it for a good amount of time this morning. He couldn't find anything wrong with it, so uh, he was gonna bring it back today and meet with them, Wendy, is that correct? And yeah. Talk over operation of the dump trailer to make sure that it was not maybe operator error in some fashion. You know, that with those electric hydraulic trailers, if you load them too heavily, they won't they won't lift so that could very well have been the problem but he was going to work with them directly on that and the packer the, the trash truck is in the garage at the county uh, right now because it was wasn't running properly is that what he said and yeah it wasn't, wasn't shifting properly right 
So uh, I called up there today to get a status report on it, and they hadn't even pulled it in the garage yet. They're going to pull it in tomorrow. Um, but their plan is to have it back to us in time for trash on Thursday. Anything you want to add to that? I don't know if any of you have been down to the public works area lately, um, but we have a tremendous stockpile of millings down there. This will save us a lot of money over the next few years because we won't have to buy any gravel. I dare say we probably won't have to buy any gravel for three or four years. And all of that is free of charge. All we had to have was room for them to dump it down there. So that's a that's a windfall of savings for the town because we're probably we've probably been spending six or seven, maybe even eight thousand dollars a year on gravel for the alleys and the uh, low areas. We shouldn't have to worry about that and ration the gravel out at all. Shouldn't be a hole in any alley in town. We've got a trem tremendous stockpile of. Uh, Melons down there to work with. So uh, we ain't got anywhere else to put in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're pretty full down there. We're probably gonna have to get them to push some of it up into a pile so well, that we can uh, turn around. I was wondering if we had somewhere else we could dump some more. <laughs> I don't know. Well, much I so. <laughs> but and that, it's a it's a big savings for the town. I think that's. A good thing. So, um, I had a call from Chris Fisher last week, and even though they have been working down here a lot and writing a lot of tickets, we're not going to receive a check in July and August from our fines, and that's because they're they're switching judges. They're getting a new general district judge in in Allegheny County. And they're also uh, appointing, uh, after several years, a circuit uh, court judge. July 1st, Ed Stein will be the new circuit court judge. And there'll be a new general district court judge uh, taking the, the bench the 1st of July. So all the court cases that they had scheduled have been pushed back to August, which means they try the cases in August we won't get the check for our fine revenue until September. It's coming, it's just gonna be a little bit delayed. Um, and I, I talked with Wendy and that, that's not gonna impact us uh, a great deal. Uh, we're gonna be able to work through that and be all right, right? Yes. Okay. Wendy and I attended a um, informational meetings uh, at the City of Covington put on by the City of Covington's attorney and the whole emphasis of the meeting was on the Freedom of Information Act and what applied, what did not apply, proper requests, proper responses to quest, requests, proper actions on our part to people that make requests for information under the Freedom of Information Act. And one thing, or a couple things that we learned that we, I didn't really understand, but maybe Wendy did, but nothing falls under the Freedom of Information Act until we have it. If a document is produced by somebody else, it is, it is, we're not obligated to provide that to anybody under the Freedom of Information Act until we physically have it in our hand. Okay? The other side of that coin is if somebody requests something, a large document if you will, we have five business days from your request to produce that document. I can't imagine anything that we would be requested of that we would need five business days to produce. But it's built into the FOIA that you have that. And if you really want to push it back, you can extend that 
to seven additional days, right? So, and I'm just putting that open because people seem to want to walk in on Wendy and expect immediate gratification right then on what they want, like she doesn't have anything else to do. And then the other thing, if there is no document for the information that's being requested, simply reply to them, it doesn't exist. And so long as you don't have it and it doesn't exist, that's the only response you can have. And that the way you understood that? Yes. Okay. But make no mistake about it. If somebody makes a request for something under the Freedom of Information Act, you have to respond. You have to respond. You either have to provide the documentation that they're asking for, you have to tell them why you can't provide the documentation that they're asking for. One, it doesn't exist. Two, it's not in our possession. Three, it's of a private uh, personnel or legal matter that cannot be disclosed at, at this time, right? <coughs> you can also make a charge for researching and producing those documents. And I think we've got a table of charges already listed in there, don't we? I think so. For copies and research time and things of that nature. Now, I don't know of anybody that's ever asked us for anything <coughs> under the Freedom of Information Act that we haven't responded and given it to them. Because that's one thing we want to make sure of, and that is that we're completely upfront about everything. So I, I think that that will remain our our goal, Wendy, is if somebody asks for something, we'll make every effort to give it to them with the understanding that sometimes it's just not possible or sometimes it takes a little bit longer than while they're here waiting for it, to be able to give it to them. Yeah. Anything I missed on that? Any questions about any of that? Jerry, is that how you understood it works? Yes. And you can only produce documentation like it has to be a resident of Virginia. I, that's, that is a good point. I forgot about that. The Freedom of Information Act that we come under only pertains to citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So if somebody used to live here, and they don't live here now, they, they moved to California, and they call here and want Wendy to produce something under the Freedom of Information Act, we're not obligated by the Freedom of Information Act to give that information to them. I would think that we would err on the side of providing them what they wanted because we don't have anything to hide. But at the same time, you're not obligated to do that. Even from what I understand, if they still own property here, you're not obligated to respond to that request if they are not a legally bona fide resident of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Right? Yes. Any questions on that? Randy? Mm -hmm. Kawana? No, sir. Rick? No. Fisher? Donnie? No. Anybody? I found it to be a very informative. Uh, actually, it was only about 35 minutes, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. He covered a lot of information. Uh, we've both got uh, copies of the packet and information. So if anybody wants to see it, we'd be happy to share that with you. Uh, so you'll have it. We had a um, lengthy discussion last month about 8th Street and the intersection of 8th Street and Market Avenue beside the Presbyterian Church. And it kept, it, it kept being referred to as that section of 8th Street had been abandoned. That word was used numerous times, it had been abandoned. And my belief at that time was that 8th Street, the right of way of 8th Street had never ever been abandoned. And on some further research, I found out that I was exactly correct on that. What happened was when VDOT took over maintenance of the streets in the town of Iron Gate, they stopped their maintenance for everything below the schoolhouse at the mountainside of Market Avenue. 
So that little portion of 7th Street that goes by the Baptist Church, the portion of 8th Street that goes beside of the Presbyterian Church, this portion of 9th Street that goes beside the uh, Old Advent Christian Church, and then 10th Street is a dead end at Market Avenue. But all of those that I just listed, they are still identified as town-owned street right-of-ways, undeveloped, unmaintained by the state, but a public right-of-way nonetheless, just like um, Crescent Avenue up here where Bob Balzer lives, Lithia Street going down by uh, Calvin Griffins, um, over here at the ER lives on, I can't remember the name of that street, Carey Street. They are not state maintained roads, but they are town owned street right of ways. Railroad Avenue uh, has a continuance from, uh, I'm assuming that uh, the portion of Railroad Avenue that goes through the playground was abandoned when the playground was put in, in place. But we're going to look into that too. But you know, the railroad avenue ends at the playground down there below your house, Jimmy. And then it picks up for one block that's paved right there in front of my house and by Donnie's house. But there's a right of way owned by the town coming up through the park over the hill to tie in right there. And it continues down behind um, um, Persingers and Fowlers and Nicely's and Nick's right on down through there to where the council just recently abandoned it at 9th Street uh, to go with that portion of property that was sold uh, in the triangle down there. Just because there's not a, a maintained roadway there by VDOT doesn't mean that it is not a public right of way. The question kept coming up and I kept getting phone calls on it about uh, well if I own property and that's my access to my property, what am I supposed to do if I build a house on that back side of my property? Well, I mean it's a maintained right of way. Well not a maintained right of way, but an owned, identified public right of way. And it's usable, you know. We, we have a contractor that comes down when it snows, moves the snow on those streets, um, tries to keep them open. Uh, there's not a lot of traffic on those streets. The lot's not going to maintain them. Anything that's done to them, the town's going to have to do to it, which we've been doing it for years anyway but it is still identified as a street right away. Okay? And Randy, any questions on that? Uh, how does that affect that problem that went on down I, I cannot answer that question. question. We're, we're gonna have to go back and talk to um, our zoning administrator and see how that affects anything. And I will do that before the council meeting. And I'll also ask you well, to do a call. Kawana, you have any questions about that? No, sir. Just while we're talking about this, and you know this already because you and I have talked about it, there's an alley right away. Yes, sir. Down between your two garages. Yes, sir. And there's an alley right away behind the old schoolhouse that comes all the way down over the hill and goes be behind where Charles Long used to live and then behind uh, Sue Wills and ties up with the alley behind your house. And then the same thing over there behind us, there's an alley right away that comes down over there and ties in behind Don Reynolds' house. They're not developed, never going to be developed, but they're there. And there, if you look on the map back here, they're very clearly identified as those right-of-ways. Jimmy, you got any questions? No. I understand that. Richard? No. Donnie? No. 
Anybody? Jennifer, you look like you had something? Uh, no, I was thinking. Oh, is that what that looks like? It's kind of dangerous. So, you know, we'll need to, uh, we'll need to talk with everybody that's concerned about this whole situation yeah. and, and see where we stand on it. But I, I just want to clear that up because I, I knew that it was still identified as a street right away, nothing had been abandoned over there. 